So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Paula Wielander, who is coming to us from Stanford. Um, she is a person who occupies that space between microbiology and organic chemistry, which you might recognize as the space that I also try to occupy. Uh, Paula is a little bit more on the molecular biology side of things and can do things with genes that I could never dream of. <laughs> Um, she started her career at Occidental College in LA um, and then moved on and did her PhD with Diane Newman. Um, Bill that Oh, Bill that Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Um, and then then, they, then Diane Newman. Then Diane Newman. Um, and that was a combination of MIT and Caltech based on never being around, right? Yeah, I was only at MIT. Okay. Interviewed at Caltech, worked at MIT, and then she left them on with the budget. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yep, and so she'll tell us all about her work in identifying who actually makes biomarkers um, in the environment. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for inviting me to this, this wonderful seminar series. I was really honored that I was asked. Um, so, you know, geobiology is a very interdisciplinary field. And I often feel, like, like Maggie said, I come in more from the molecular side. And I really got into this field as a postdoc, really not knowing any <laughs> And so to be welcomed by these communities and to be taught and be, you know, accepted has been really great. And Kate has been one of the most influential people in that area. I mean, it is, um, you know, to create an opening and exclusive environment for lots of different scientists from different environments. And um, for me, I, I work a lot in the DEI space and diversity, equity, inclusion, and trying to create a more inclusive environment. And one of the things we always point to is how needing to have role models needing to have people that look like you that are like you in these and leading these these fields is really important and i feel kate is one of these people who i've looked up to as a woman in science and has really kind of motivated me to be like yes i can do this and to see her do it with such grace and empathy is just wonderful and so i'm honored that i would be in this series when you're kind of the winner of this prize so thank you again for inviting me um so when um, I wanted to share a couple of different stories, I know that um, there's a, um, a lot of different stories that I could uh, go at. So I'm going to try to do this in a way that hopefully <laughs> will work and hopefully transitions are smooth and we'll see how it goes. But so, you know, as I've been saying, geobiology is a very interdisciplinary field. And one of the things that my, particularly my undergrads, when we're talking about geobiology, they look there. The idea that you can have geology and biology intersecting isn't always so clear to them, particularly when they see me as someone who works with genes and proteins and microbes, they're like, where are you coming from? And so if I tell them to step back and think about, you know, what really ties all geobiologists together, because there's a lot of us that are chemists and geologists and you know, biologists, and we're kind of all over the place. I think the thing that really ties us together is we're really interested in understanding how the evolution of, um, the evolution of life, as well as the evolution of our planet, have co have uh, interacted with each other over time, right? And so this is really kind of like what we're interested in on a big scale: how these two systems have pushed and pulled against each other. Because changes in the evolution of our planet, changes in the chemistry of our planet, have significantly impacted how life has evolved. And the evolution of different metabolisms of life has also affected the surface chemistry of our planet. So how do these two processes work together? And if you're a geobiologist that's interested in <laughs> these things that happen when the planet looked like this, then what you're really interested in is understanding how microbial life has evolved. Because there is a point in, you know, for the majority of life history on Earth, it's been only microbial on our planet. And so if you're interested in this in deep time, you're interested in microbes. And so that raises this interesting question is, how do we link microbes to the rock record? Right? Because what I've learned being in the field of geobiology is that our primary record of the Earth's evolution, of life's evolution, is in the rock record. And we want to tie these microbes and these processes to that record. And so how does this happen when you have these little microbes that you can't even use in a microscope to see? Um, and so there's a lot of really creative ways to do this. There are actually morphological signatures that can be attributed to microbes, whether they be um, you know, single cells that are preserved as cyanobacteria in the rock record, or whether they're larger communities like stromatolites that we know are of microbial origin that are preserved in the rock record. There are these types of um, morphological signatures that we can see. There are also chemical signatures, isotopes, which you've heard a lot about in this seminar series, I assume. 
Um, these can be diagnostic for certain microbial metabolism, certain types of microbes that you can use them to link uh, microbes to the rock record. And then there are actually molecules that microbes leave behind. And this is the space that my research group um, fits into. And we study in particular lipids that can be preserved in the rock record. And so how does this work? So this is very straightforward. You can imagine an ancient environment where you have a whole bunch of microbes growing and living. They die and they settle into the sediment. And what is left behind through the process of this sediment turning into a rock through deposition and preservation, um, you know, you lose the DNA, you lose the protein, all of those things are liable, but molecules such as these, these lipid molecules tend to be conserved. You lose a lot of like the hydroxylation and some of the, um, the bells and whistles, per se, but the basic structure can be maintained. And you can have geochemists that can come in and extract these from rocks and uh, identify them using very uh, sensitive mass spec techniques and then dependent on the ratios that they find, the age of the rock, the different molecules that they find, they can make certain interpretations about what taxonomic groups were present at the time of deposition, what metabolisms may have been occurring at the time, and maybe even environmental conditions. Is it an acidic environment and an oxic environment? Kind of those are, um, types of interpretations. So this process has many steps, and there's people working in all these areas, people working on how these molecules are preserved, the taphonomy of these molecules, people who go into the rocks and pull these out um, and detect them, people who groups of people who work on developing much more sensitive mass spec techniques to even um, better uh, um, uh, detect these molecules. And so my group does none of that. <laughs> what my group focuses on is this point. Can we study these in modern organisms to better aid the interpretation of the molecules that are being found in the rock record? And so how do we do that? So basically the, the kind of the, the, um, the methodology has developed in my lab is we will identify a microbe or a biomarker or something that we need more information on that we don't understand the sources of, we don't understand um, um, what these molecules are being made for. And so typically we'll find an organism and the first question we have is like, okay, we know this organism makes this, this uh, biomarker, do we understand how? And what I mean by how is the biosynthesis, where are the proteins involved in this process and converting and generating this final molecule? If we don't know, then we look and we find it. And once we are able to identify these proteins, that opens up a lot of different experiments that we can do. We can look at the biochemistry. We can look at how this molecule is being made by this protein. Is it the same protein in every organism? And if it's not, um, does it affect the, the uh, isotope generation that we're making based on the, bio, um, the protein that's being used here? Um, so we can do those kinds of experiments. We can do physiological experiments. We're really great at making gene deletions, so we can knock out the ability to produce this lipid. That's one question. Can you even knock it out? Is it essential? And if you can knock it out, under what physiological conditions does it become relevant that this molecule is actually necessary? Um, and so those are lab experiments we can do. We can also do um, um, a lot of molecular phylogeny to try to trace the evolutionary history of the synthesis of so the biosynthetic pathway of these lipids. And we can answer questions like, when did this ability to make this molecule evolve? You know, does that coincide with what we see in the rock record? Do we see these in the rock record, you know, 600 million years ago, but the phylogeny tells us it should be present 2 million years ago, right? And so what's that gap? Um, so you can do that kind of work. The other thing you can do is, um, if you know the proteins, you can identify other organisms that might be making these molecules because you know the gene and the protein, and you can go into genomic databases and say, what organism have we not tested that might be making this molecule? So it really kind of can get at sources. So there's a lot we can do once we identify that. And so in my research group, we have um, a wonderful group of students and postdocs that are, each have their own special biomarker that they're interested in and that they're working on. And so today I'm gonna to share two stories with you. And the first story I wanted to share with you is a one that um, began many years ago with a former postdoc of mine, Ray, who is now a professor at uh, SUS Tech in Xinjiang, China. Um, and we collaborated with uh, Xiaoli Liu, who's a wonderful organic geochemist at the University of Oklahoma, and my former postdoc, Roger Summit, on this story. Okay, and so this story looks at our ability to be able to constrain pegged temperature proxies by looking at lipid synthesis in archaea. So this story begins with understanding what are archaea. <laughs> so archaea are some of my favorite bugs. Um, these are microbes that I worked with in graduate school. And the reason I love archaea is because we were studying archaea for 50, 60 years. Um, before we realized they were archaea. <laughs> As you can see, these organisms look just like micro, um, like bacteria under the microscope, uh, but it turns out they're actually, from an evolutionary perspective, distinct from these organisms. And the way we figure this out 
is that in the 1970s, Carl Rose, um, who um, I said they were at the University of Illinois, my alma mater, um, he, he had this, um, what, what drove his research, what he was interested in, being able to taxonomically classify microbes um, in the context of the evolutionary history. So at the time, he classified microbes by what they looked like or what they ate, and there wasn't any evolutionary relationship. And so what Carl Wills pioneered, what he's really known for, is the ability to use genetics to molecularly um, construct phylogenies, right? And so his idea was to take this one marker, the 16S uh, ribosomal gene, as the marker that you can use to trace the evolutionary history of microbes and draw these kind of trees to see how microbes are related to each other relative to other organisms like us as well. Um, and his idea was to build this tree of life. In doing so, what he discovered was using this molecular phylogeny, at the time there was kind of, you could divide um, all organisms into two groups, bacteria and basically not bacteria, <laughs> bacteria and eukaryotes, eukaryotes, we're eukaryotes, we have um, nucleuses in our, in, our, um, in our cells, bacteria do not, that was kind of the main distinction. And what he found when he did this molecular phylogeny that yes, he got the two um, classifications, the bacteria and the eukaryotes, but then there was this third group that was falling out in the middle. And this third group were all microbes, but based on the molecular phylogeny, they were no more related to the bacteria, closely related to the bacteria than they were to animals. They were their own distinct group. This was very controversial in the 70s. And over time, it has been proven that this is, from an evolution perspective, a distinct group of microbes known as the archaea. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's been done on the archaea. There's a lot of ways that they're similar to other microbial organisms, and there's a lot of ways that they're unique. And one of the ways that they're unique is in their membrane limits. So if we look at the structure of a membrane, and if you remember, a membrane is this like um, bilayer that you have kind of a hydrophilic uh, component and a hydrophobic component. That structure is maintained in their membranes, but the chemistry is slightly different. Whereas they have these um, isoprenoid chains here, um, these are fatty acids in bacteria and eukaryotes. So the chemistry of them is a little different and how they're made in terms of the genes and protein and pathways are different. These are ester linked, whereas these are ether linked. These ether, ether linkages are much stronger and more difficult to break. And then the backbone, they're both connected to these glycerol phosphate groups that have a different state of chemistry. So that's a big distinction in the membrane structure of these organisms when we think of them broadly. The other thing that is really wild about the um, archaeolipids is that they tend to fuse them. So you remember your bilayer from you know, high school um, biology, right? You have this bilayer that's formed. Archaea will then take that bilayer and fuse it and make these monolayer membranes. And then on top of that, they'll take these lipids that they fuse together, which we call GDVTs, and they'll add rings to them. Right? We have no idea <laughs> like, how they actually do this. This is really wild when we first started looking at these. Um, and so one of, now I'm sharing this with you because as you probably can imagine, these are also very well preserved in the rock record. Right? And it turns out that in the early 2000s, there was this, um, they can be preserved, I think, about 100 million years. And people were starting to do these correlations in modern sediments with um, the number of rings, the different ratios of rings that they could find in sediments. And they could link that to the sea surface temperature. And so they started to generate these ratios. And one of the most, uh, probably the first one that was done and the most well known is this TEX 86 ratio, which is the tetraether index of 86 carbons, which is how many carbons are in the ring. Um, and they found that it really correlated well with sea surface temperature if they took certain ratios of certain ring um, um, on GDDTs. Um, so there's been a lot of work done to try to validate this. There's a lot of data that goes into kind of analyzing whether this correlation can stick with environmental data. And it seems to be the, the thing that most correlates with, with the ring index is temperature, right? So there's this idea that you can go back in time and you can assess the, the presence and the ratios of these um, cyclized GDGTs, and you can make uh, predictions about what the sea surface temperature were. You can make models that can predict what the sea surface temperature will be in the future. So it's a really um, powerful tool. But like a lot of proxies that we have in geology, there are assumptions that are made. And our assumptions aren't bad, but you know, what we want to do to validate these further is we want to um, make sure that these assumptions are true. And so one of the assumptions that's made in this proxy is that there's one major source of these in the marine water column. And these are known as the Tom Archaeota. So this is a group of archaea that are ammonia oxidizers. They're very slow growers. And they, um, there's only a few that are in culture. Um, and so they've been studied 
um, more from the genomic standpoint, and we know their distribution in different environments. We know that they're actually not just uh, restricted to marine uh, water column, they're also found in a lot of terrestrial and other aquatic environments, but they're the only archaea known to produce this specific um, um, GDGT that has that six carbon ring in the middle that is also important for the TEX86 um, pivot, pivot proxy. Um, they're known as marine group one in the water column. So you'll hear me sometimes refer to this as marine group one. Um, and so it's made the assumption that in the water column, this is the primary producer of cyclized GDGT. And they're the ones that are, this broad group of organisms are the ones that are driving the signal that we're seeing and in correlation with sea surface temperature. But in 2014, there was a paper that looked at the distribution of different archaea in the water column. And what they found was if you look at the upper part of the water column, the marine group two, um, which are Uri archaea, a different group archaea, were dominant at the upper levels, and the marine group one were dominant at the lower levels. So in this paper, they said, is it possible that these um, archaea are also contributing to the pools of cyclized GDGTs? So why would that matter, right? Because we're saying there's a correlation between the amount of rings you make to temperature. Why would it matter if it's another archaea? Well, it turns out that this signal that they're seeing could be dri driven instead of by changes in temperature, changes in community, right? That you're just seeing a shift from one set of organisms to another. Um, and that can skew the signal a little bit if we think about it, right? So it's important to know what the actual source is. Um, and the problem we have here is that no one has cultured these organisms. We have been unable to get them in the lab and test their lipids to see if they even make the cyclized DDT. And this uh, distribution shown here is based on the 16S RNA gene that Carl Wells pioneered as a marker. That has nothing to do with lipids. That tells you nothing about the lipids that they're making. And so to really get at what the source is in the marine water column, is it only the marine group one? Is the marine group two actually uh, play a role? We felt you needed to understand what the proteins were that are making this DDT cyclization from happening. Um, and then when you have that, you can search these data sets for that protein and determine from what organisms are potentially coming from. But the problem we have is we don't know what the proteins are. And so this is where Ray picked up the project. And Ray wanted to know, how do you convert we presume that it was occurring by taking this GDDT0 and then adding the rings. What is the type of protein that is involved there? And so the way we usually tackle these problems is we take a deep dive into the literature because people have thought about this. People have thought about biochemistry, what kind of proteins might be involved. And we can really narrow it down to a specific group of proteins that we can look for in the genome of an organism. But nobody had said anything about this in the literature. This is such a hard reaction to do because all of these carbons here are inert. They're really hard to activate. And I think people would just like, we have no idea how this happened. These bugs are weird. This is weird chemistry. We don't know what's going on. So we went out on a limb and we thought, well, there had been some suggestion in the, in the literature that this required what we call a radical mechanism. And so we thought, okay, this requires radical chemistry because these are so hard to break. Could this possibly require what we call a radical sand What I don't know. What is a radical sand protein? <laughs> so what is a radical sand protein? So radical sand proteins are this huge class of proteins that are characterized by this very specific cysteine motif in the corner, right here. This cysteine motif here is seen in, in these proteins that do all kinds of chemistry. In us, in bacteria, we have radical sand proteins. They're, like, they're, they're very, very broad. But what they do is they take this molecule, S adenosine methionine, they cleave off a methionine and generate this radical. This radical, radical can then go in and do the hard chemistry. And it can be something as breaking a carbon-carbon bond, can be you know, forming a carbon sulfur bond, but this kind of protein is very broad. And so we thought, okay, let's look inside an archaeal genome, find a radical sand proteins and identify candidates that might be doing this. And so the organism we chose, chose to work with is Sulfurobus acetocaldarius, which is not a marine organism and it's not a marine group two or one. And the reason is because um, this organism we knew made GDG2's ring, and it had what we said a genetic system, which meant we can manipulate this organism, we can do the change, and we can get at trying to identify the protein of interest in this one. And we were making the assumption that it would then be same in all archaea that make rings, right? So there is another assumption we're making here. So we went into the genome of this organism and we found that it had 17 radical sand proteins. And this is based on this protein family annotation here. So it's really easy to search for these types of proteins. And 17 is a great number. Usually you'll look for a protein family in a genome and you'll get like 500. <laughs> so this was like, wow, this doesn't have that many. And if we're right about the radical chemistry, then we have a good set of proteins we can look for. 
But we can pare this down further by doing uh, homology searches or comparisons. So we took those 70 radical SAM proteins and said, okay, we know these archaea make rings and these archaea do not make rings. Which archaea have a radical SAM protein that is missing in the archaea that don't make rings, right? When we did that analysis, we narrowed it down to three proteins within our organism, which is totally manageable. <laughs> so the other assumption we made is that we would be able to delete these and we were able to delete them. So Ray went ahead and started to delete these potential candidates. What I'm showing you here is a chromatogram of the wild type. And this is a GDDT. The numbers above are telling you uh, of the lipid extract, how many rings are present on the, um, in the actual lipid. So he generated the first mutant, which was the 1585 mutant. And right away, we got a really great result. You can see that we go to making predominantly something without rings, but we're still making a couple of rings here. And so I said to, to Ray, I'm like, this is great. You looks like you have a good candidate, but you're still making rings, and I want that to be zero. <laughs> and so he deleted the other ones, and he wasn't seeing what he was seeing. And he started making double deletion mutants. And sure enough, when he made this combination of, of mutants, uh, this two, these two candidates, he found went to completely getting uh, rid of all the rings. Right, so super exciting. He went on to complement this, and it turns out that these two proteins are the proteins necessary to be able to generate all the rings in this particular organism. So when you discover something like this, you get to name it. <laughs> so we got to name these two proteins. We chose GDGT ring synthases, GRSs. So this is GRSA and GRSB. We went on to do a series of experiments to get at how these um, GRSA and B are generating these rings. I don't have time to get into all the biochemistry that we went into and the chemistry, but I'll give you the big picture. What we ended up finding was that the one of these GRSA is responsible for adding rings specifically at the C7 position, GRSB adding rings specifically at the C3 position. And we also showed that this reaction was sequential, that you would add rings first, GRSA would be first, where is my friend? Okay, to uh, GDGT0. Uh, to generate this, and then the substrate for DRSB is one that already has the rings. And so this was really interesting because this meant that you really should not see in the sediment and in nature something that has rings only at this position because the reaction is sequential. So it got us to kind of limit um, what we might see in the rock record. Okay. Uh, but then to get at our big question that I started out is, you know, we know the proteins now. So can I answer this question? Are the marine group one the most major source of cyclic ocean? And so we went back to the data set generated by this paper in 2014, and I found that 38 of the metagenomes were available in the database for us to search. So I thought, oh, great, can we then search this to try to find our GRSs in these metagenomes and identify what organisms might be making them? So we searched these databases and we found over 1,400 homologs um, within, where is my <laughs> there we go, <laughs> within this um, data set. So 14 homos, and what I'm showing you here is the depth. So they had all their data sets by depth. And you can see that the majority of sequences that we were getting were in the deeper depths. We had a couple up here, but like really nothing at the surface in terms of uh, sequences there. Okay, so then the next question was, can we identify whether these GRS homologs in our data set, these 1400 are from marine group one, two, or five, well, who are they coming from? And so what we did is we took all of the homologs and so when you do metagenomic sequences, you might not always get the full length sequence of the protein. And when you're doing alignment, which is what I'm going to do to try to figure out where these, these um, GRSs fall, um, um, you need kind of the whole length. So I selected from this whole data set ones that were larger than 400 amino acids that would constitute the full protein. That cut my set in half. So a lot of the sequencing, because I think this was an older data set, was not full. So, but then still 700 proteins. And then from that, I did this exercise where you reduce the uh, redundancy. So a lot of times, you know, you have the same protein coming up from the same organism, and you can run it through a couple of programs that will kind of tell you this is a distinct one. There's like seven of these, so it just takes one out. When I did that, I went down to eight, right? So that means that those 1,400 sequencings are coming from a not a very diverse group of organisms. It's a very specific set of organisms that are that we're detecting GRSs from. Um, and so when I I uh, looked at where those eight were present. I actually had one or two sequences from each depth, which was great. I, I thought they were all going to be like at a thousand meters, but they were all from uh, each data set. I was able to pull out one. So I took these eight and I said, I'm going to make a tree. So we have a lot of GRSs from archaea that are already uh, cultured or from metagenomes. And so I can make a big tree 
and see where these eight sequences are landing, which group of RK are they most closely related to? So I made the tree, and this is just to show you, overwhelm you with my wonderful tree. <laughs> so these are all the DRSs that we have access to at the time. And what I'm going to do is zoom in here in red. You can, those are the ones that are from this metagenomic data set. And when I zoom in on those, you can see that all eight of them are landing within marine group one, Tom Arfioda. None of these are landing outside of these groups. So even at the highest depth of 25 meters, where we don't see a lot of these marine group ones, if I pull up a GRS, it's from a marine group one organism that is living up at the surface, <laughs> which is not probably very abundant. Okay. The other thing that happened when we were writing this paper up is a paper came out with um, 270 marine group two mags. So these are metagenome acquired genomes. So they pulled out the genomes of these marine group two organisms, but um, they don't have an organism yet, but they can cluster the genes together. And so we were able to search these. These are from a variety of marine environments. And what we found was that we could not find any DRS homologs in these groups. And so this is like a very curated group of marine group two. And so this is kind of a second level of saying that in these marine water columns, these organisms are probably not making the lipids that we think are, even though they're the dominant source at the surface. Okay, so with this data, we can say that the marine group one are the major source of side by side GDGTs in the open ocean now. So that is the correct assumption in terms of technique. Can this change? Potentially, <laughs> it can always happen. And so one of the things that, um, um, I'm having Annie, my uh, graduate student, do is to look into other data sets. And I encourage anyone who does this, who has metagenomes from um, uh, water, um, marine environments, to look at the data sets so we can curate and see is this true or is this just very specific for this North, you know, North Pacific subtropical gyre data that I was looking at. Um, and so, but we now have the tool. We can reanalyze our metagenomic data and kind of see. And my assumption is that yes, so far, what Annie has found is that they are potentially the only ones that we can find. We can't find anything in the marine group too. The other thing is the marine group two might make them, but they make them through a different biochemical mechanism, which would be really cool. There's another way to do the same project. It would make things complicated, but it's, you know, that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> to see what this are. Okay. So then um, Andy has continued to work on this stuff. Ray has moved on to his faculty position. And Andy's kind of trying to really focus in on uh, looking at GRSs from other archaea. Can he find the GRS that's making that six carbon ring? We still haven't found it. He's working on that. He's looking at doing the biochemistry and really understanding these proteins from a biochemical perspective. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in terms of understanding and characterizing these GDDT ring proteins. Okay. So that was the first story. I can answer any questions on the first story. <laughs> uh, so showing that the genes exist in the organisms in the water column, it indicates very strongly the capacity to make the mm -hmm. difference. But it doesn't necessarily tell us that they are or mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. and or their quantity. Mm -hmm. And so the, do the does the Lincoln data set have a quantity of GBGTs associated with the um, the profiles that were published? They do, they do. Um, I'm trying to think. I think they did see cyclized GBGTs in the upper water column. They were not very abundant, but they did attribute them to the marine group to urea crater without like being able to show. But yeah, I hadn't thought about linking the GRS data. Like if, if I show that the only one up at the like the 25 meter, there's like one GRS, it may come from a marine group one G Tom Archeota, right. then it would probably be the most likely source. There's no transcriptomics data, which would show. So when you should look at metagenomic data, it's showing you that the gene exists. Mm -hmm. When you look at transcriptomic data, it's showing you the gene is being expressed, right. Right? right? And so you can have 100 genes existing and only one is being transcribed, um, would be the next step. Yeah, that data set is a little older, so that one's a little hard to kind of pull up, um, that, that kind of data. It's, it's a great data set. Um, but yeah, this is why I think we need to kind of, there's very few examples where people have done the metagenomics and the lipids and the metatranscriptomics in the environment right. together. They're always kind of a little disjointed. Um, so, but, um, but yeah. yeah. But the hot set uh, monitoring program continues. Yeah, right? yeah, and, yeah. And I mean, I bet they would be open to yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Andy has just done this dive deep. So Andy joined in the fall of 2020. <laughs> and so the, the first project was like, stay home and do some bioinformatics. <laughs> and so they have a, like, the tree is just huge now. And they've been trying to like, 
there's so many metagenomic data sets available, it's kind of hard to. Um, so they're trying to figure out a way that they can hone in a little bit because it's a little bit much right now. But yeah, definitely. All right. All right. So the next project I wanted to talk to you very quickly in the short amount of time I have is um, one that is focused on sponge biomarkers. And this is a story that has just uh, been carried out by my grad student, Mallory Brown, in collaboration with uh, Jose Pinar at the State University of New York uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He's our NMR specialist. We've been able to confirm a lot of structures for that. So this project is looking at sterols. And probably the sterile you all recognize the most is cholesterol, because we make cholesterol and it can cause a lot of problems for us. Um, but cholesterol is a very fascinating molecule from a biological perspective that's been studied for many, many years. Um, the primary role that we think cholesterol has is in helping maintain membrane fluidity in our membranes. I mean, like under different temperature stresses, when our membranes can change their structure. And, and cholesterol is a rigidifier that can help make sure under different stress conditions, um, the membrane maintains its proper structure. But it's also a, a precursor to a lot of like hormones and vitamins. And so it's being synthesized and metabolized a lot in organisms to generate these signaling molecules. In some organisms, it can work as a sensor. Um, in yeast in particular, the accumulation of sterile intermediates indicates to a cell it doesn't have enough oxygen. And so it can um, generate an anoxic response in yeast in particular. And even with bacteria, bacteria typically don't make sterile, but they will eat sterile. Uh, pathogenic bacteria that live, say, in our macrophages and infect us will take cholesterol from the membrane and eat it for energy purposes. So there is um, a lot of connections within, um, within human health to cholesterol. But as you probably all know, these are also preserved as biomarkers, or otherwise I wouldn't be talking about them. <laughs> um, and so cholesterol can be degraded and preserved as cholestane. And this is kind of the most basic cholesterol-based, sterile-based but biomarker. And this is typically used as a biomarker for two things, as eukaryotes broadly, because eukaryotes all require some form of cholesterol. If they can't make it, they have to take it in from their diet. Things like Drosophila flies and nematodes, they don't make cholesterol, but they take in, um, it, they take it in by eating other organisms that make it. Um, and then the synthesis of all sterols requires oxygen. So if you're in an environment where you find a cholestane molecule, you know that there's oxygen present there. It's not a lot, you don't need a ton of oxygen, but there needs to be oxygen in order to be able to make this because we have not discovered an anoxic way of making these sterile molecules. And these are some of the most well-preserved, they're preserved as far back as 1.6 billion years old, years ago. Okay, the other thing about sterols is that they can be more diagnostic, diagnostic for other organisms based on modification. So if you add methylations, uh, this is shown here, and propylations that can be specific for certain types of higher order organisms like algae, then plants, which are sponges. And so today I wanted to focus on this particular biomarker, 24 IPC, isopropyl cholesterol, which is a biomarker for sponges. Um, and so in 2009, this paper came out that said they had one that sponges were the most predominant producers of this type of molecule that has a propyl group at the C24 position shown here which is very rare and kind of hard to do biochemically. And they identified this in rocks that were about 645 million years old. And this was um, interesting and surprising because um, at the time, we, depending on which sponge um, morphological fossil you believe in, and I have since learned that this can be controversial, <laughs> um, but it meant that it pushed back the record of what we have for sponges, which are the first animals to evolve about 50 million years to 100 million years past what we have in terms of morphological fossils, right? So you have the, the chemical fossil record is telling you that sponges are older than what the morphological fossil record was. And so the idea was, why don't we see more sponges at 645 million years if this marker is indicated with sponges? Nonetheless, that has been controversial. There has been a lot of going back and forth in the literature about whether you can use this as a biomarker for sponges. And if the fossils are missing, then you know we have to look at the morphological fossils. A lot of back and forth. Uh, geologists like to debate. <laughs> and so, and one of and so there's a couple of different things that we can look at that make this a controversial biomarker. The first one is is that there are alternative sources. So you know, um, the paper that the previous paper stated that sponges were the most predominant producers of this molecule here on here. But there's also been evidence that algae and rhizaria can produce this molecule, the 24 IPC, but they also make this 
and propyl cholesterol. And this is the predominant one that they make, but they, in that process, they're also making this one. So these paper are these are microbial eukaryotes. These are probably more likely to have been present there than sponges, particularly because we don't see the fossils. The, the problem is, is that it's not just the presence of 24 IPC that indicates potentially sponges, it's the ratios. So if we look at the ratios of making 24 IPC versus NPC in these different organisms, the sponges make the majority you know, of 24 IPC and a trace amount of this one, and it's the reverse in the algae. They make trace amount of this one, and then they make the majority of the NPC. And so if you look in these uh, neoprotozoic Cambrian rocks, the ratio is more resembling of what we see in the sponge. And so it's not just about the presence of the molecule being there, but the different ratios that they're making. And this was really interesting in this paper is that they claim the only reason the algae were making any of the 24 IPC was because it was an aberration of an enzymatic process. So whatever enzyme was making their NPC would mess up and make some propyl on the side. Okay? So that was kind of what they were arguing with that. Um, and so that got us curious. How do you make a 24 propyl IPC, right? And so we looked in the literature, and it turns out there's a very specific set of enzyme known as C24 steromethyltransferases. And, and these have been studied in two different types of eukaryotes, in yeast and plant. So yeast can add one methyl group, and so they have one steromethyltransferase, and plants can add two groups, so they can acylate, and they have two steromethyltransferases. And this got us wondering, you know, what about these other eukaryotes? What are their steromethyltransferases? And has anyone actually shown that you can make a propylated, whether it's isopropylated or impropylated, with one of these steromethyltransferases? So in 2016, there was a paper that came out from Roger Summons group uh, authored by, uh, led by a postdoc, David Gold, who is now a professor at UC Davis. And what he was looking at, he went into these genomes of these weird eukaryotes <laughs> and looked to see whether they had steromethyltransferases. And he found a pattern. He found that the number of SMTs that you had equal to the number of alkylations. So if you had one SMT, you added one methyl group. If two SMTs, you added um, two methyl groups. And if you had three methyl, um, three, three SMTs, you added three methyl groups like you see in these algae. But that didn't hold for sponges. Sponges always had one less SMT than what he would expect based on the methylase and ethylation that was happening. And so this had him propose that there were two different pathways. So in these other microbial eukaryotes, you needed three SMTs to get to the final product, whereas in sponges, you only needed two, which meant that this final SMT shown here would be different between these two sets of organisms. And so you could compare them. And so he did a molecular clock analysis of this. And what he found was that the SMT that would propylate in sponges, the second one, was older and had evolved during the time when we see these in the rock record versus the algal one, which was um, younger and evolved post those fossils. So this was seen as evidence that, okay, so these, you know, these cannot be from an alternative source because the protein hadn't evolved in the algae. However, the problem with that is no one has confirmed this activity. <laughs> So he's doing all this molecular analysis on something that we don't know if it's actually doing the biochemistry. And so this is where um, Mallory, my graduate student, came in and she had very specific questions she wanted to ask. She's like, do these sponge SMTs actually alkylate at the C24 position? No one has shown them they're functional. Um, can sponges carry out multiple rounds of alkyl alkylation? Uh, the SMT is actually promiscuous. And which SMTs are, which one is the one that's required to propylate? If you have two or three in a genome, which one do you know is the right one, right? And so she wanted to do this um, using biochemistry. So at this point, we only have the SMTs present on the computer, right? We had a sequence. So how can we get this into the lab? So she developed a system where she could put the SMT on a plasmid, express it in E. coli, pop open the E. coli cells, and then have a tube of the protein there. And then once she had that, she mixed that in with some substrate and asked, do we see any alkylation at the C24 position? Okay, so she had a whole bunch of these that were generated for us to um, synthesize, that were generated for us to express in the lab. And so she started out looking at the sponge ones. So what I'm showing you here are chromatograms from her assays. So at the top here is the no SMT control. So this is the substrate she started with, right? And she tested these three different SMTs from these three different sponges. And sure enough, she found that all of them can methylate, so they're active in our, in our assay. And then she found that two of them could actually ethylate at this position. Um, this one is actually also ethylating, but it's really, really tiny peak, mm -hmm. but it's actually working, <laughs> but you can see it. Um, 
She went on to test a whole bunch of different sponge SNCs. All of them are ones that um, you'll notice we can pre we predict are potentially adding two methyl groups. And she found that all of them were active for at least adding one methyl group. Several of them were active for adding a second one. So they were kind of promiscuous. Um, what we don't have is we don't have one from a propylene sponge. And that is just kind of a big hole in the in the data that we have. We don't have the sequence of a sponge that propylates yet. And so we're kind of waiting for that. We're, you know, we're not sponge people. We don't go diving for sponges and we don't do these genomes. So we're kind of restricted with by the data that we have. But nonetheless, she was able to show that these are alkylating. The first time we're showing the SMTs from um, an animal actually function to methylate at the C24 position. We're showing that some of them are promiscuous. Some of them can do these multiple rounds of alkylation, but not all of them, right? And so that kind of leaves us with um, this uh, unsatisfying answer of like, are they promiscuous or not? Some of them are, some of them don't. We don't know why some are, some aren't, right? And we still don't know which SMT is actually required to propylate because none of the SMTs I show you actually were propylating. Um, and so what we are doing is we need to identify a, a sponge SMT from one that actually um, um, propylates, we need to be able to add multiple SMTs together to see if we can propylate in our assay. And we're, we're trying the assays, they haven't been successful just yet. And we haven't tested the alternative ones. We, we want to test the algal and the Rizero SMT to see if they're also functional in our assay and if they can propylate. Um, and so those are all things that are in progress and we're working on yet and we haven't gotten there yet. But there was another um, thing that we were also thinking about, okay, so we have this hypothesis that the sponge and SMTs are probably uh, alkylating multiple times. And we started to step back and think, are there other hypotheses that we're missing? And one of them was, can there possibly be that there is a third source for an SMT here, that the sponge has two of them that ethylate, but then we need a third one here from a separate source. And one potential source we thought might be is the microbiome within the sponges. So sponges are basically um, these bags of microbes. <laughs> if you look within the tissue, where is my microbe? Maybe I have to go analog for a second. <laughs> if you look here within the sponge, within the mesohyl, which is the tissue surrounding the colonocytes, these are all the microbes they can detect. This is a tree showing you the microbial diversity of microbes that are within the sponge, which is really, really fascinating. This in itself is a very fascinating field. And as it turns out, sponges are a huge source for small molecules, antibiotics, anti-cancer anti -cancer drugs. Actually, remdesivir that helps treat COVID comes from a sponge micro. <laughs> all of these, it turns out all of these molecules are made by microbes that live within the sponges. And so the hypothesis we thought is we had, what if that SMT is actually a bacterial one? <laughs> is that possible? And we looked in the genome, in the microbiome. So this is the genome sequence of the microbes within the sponge. And sure enough, we found proteins that were being annotated to NT, shown here in blue. And they're located on contexts that are next to cells, um, proteins that are involved in sterile synthesis. And these are bacterial proteins. These are not eukaryotic sponge proteins. These are from the microbiome. Um, and then Mallory kind of stepped back and said, oh, wow, it looks like they might be, the bacteria might be methylating. That's nothing we've ever thought of bacteria might be able to do. Um, and she looked at metagenomes more broadly. And she actually found SMTs in metagenomes from bacteria from all kinds of different environments that aren't living in sponges. And so she's like, is it potentially that bacteria can actually methylate, ethylate, or maybe even propylate at the C24 position? And when she took these bacterial SMTs and treated them with the sponge SMTs, she found that they were actually distinct. So up here in red, you can see those are the sponge SMTs, and down here in blue are the bacterial SMTs. So these two are phylogenetically distinct from each other. So they're different sets of proteins. They're not, it's not like the sponge acquired from, not like the bacteria acquired from a sponge or vice versa. So, but we don't know if these are actually SMTs. We need to test these. So that was the next thing Mallory wanted to do. Take her system and instead of expressing sponge SMTs, let's express um, bacterial SMTs. And so she went ahead and did this. So what I'm showing you here are the chromatograms. So this is the negative control here. And this is the SMT from four symbionts within one sponge. So there were four different SMTs she found within this one sponge. Sure enough, uh, some of them are methylating at the C24 position. Some of them are making these really weird products, <laughs> which, um, we have, which we've seen sponges produce before. 
Um, so these are SM, this is an SMT that's doing something completely different, methylating and ethylating at this other position at the end. And then there's one that's not functional at all. So within one sponge, we have one that works, one that makes weird stuff, and one that is not working at all. <laughs> so there's a diversity in terms of the SMTs. And then she went and tested them from the second uh, sponge, Aplazina aerophoba. So this one, again, I'm showing you the negative control up here. And this one, she showed no activity in this one. The second one had a ton of activity to methylate and ethylate. And then to our surprise, it looked like we were making propyls. So it looked like we had one protein that was propylating. She didn't believe this result. She went ahead and reproduced this result by uh, giving them this time, starting with a methylated substrate, thinking if you give them more of the substrate that's methylated, they'll make more propyl. Sure enough, we see the propylating ones there. We have since confirmed this by NMR. So this, this sponge SMT is truly making uh, propylated sterols on its own in one protein. Um, she went on to test a whole bunch of the symbionts. This is the only symbiont where we've seen propylation, but you know some of the symbionts make methyl, some of them make a couple of ethyl, and then some of them don't work at all. She's gone on to test some of these environmental ones that are not associated with sponges, and she sees methylation and ethylation, and in one of them, she sees a ton of propylation. So this is the negative control here, and this is the SMT from a chlamydia. Um, and again, this is just the metagenome associated genome. There is no bacterium yet that we've cultured to do this. But this protein is super active in terms of propylating on its own. So this was super exciting because we have this in one protein. And what this tells us is that there's potentially a third way <laughs> to make the propylated, and that is the bacteria have developed one protein to be able to do this. Oh, over here. There we go. <laughs> Let's make it. The um, algae seem to have three SMT is required, and the sponges might be able to do it with just um, two, potentially. Or maybe there's a combination here that's going on, which is what we're thinking. But the important thing from this is that, again, the number of SMTs in a genome does not equal the number of ethylations. If you look in a genome and you see an SMT, you do not know if that's ethylating, propylating, or methylating, right? You, know, you can't predict that now because we have a bacterium that has one SMT and can do that. Um, and so what what um, Mallory wants to do next, what she's working on now, is can she identify specific amino acid stages in the bacteria, SMTs, that make it propylating, right? And the way she's doing that is she did some comparative uh, genomics of the amino acids, and these have been studied in yeast a lot. And so she's been kind of kind of gearing her way to try to, can she mutate these so she can stop the, the uh, bacterial SMT from propylating? And when she was doing this, she actually found this one site shown here. Okay, this one site shown here. And the top, this is a yeast, um, uh, the sequence of a yeast uh, SMT that uh, only methylates. And it's got this aspartic acid here. All the propylating ones have this uh, conserved glycine here. So what she went ahead and did is she changed that aspartic acid, uh, that glycine to an aspartic acid in her propylating enzyme and then tested it. And this is data fresh off the GC, so I'm sorry that it doesn't look so good. She just generated this a couple of weeks ago. And so what I'm showing you here is you can see in black is the empty plasmid. So you have a lot of the substrate starting here, right? And red is the wild type. So in red, you see a little bit of methyl, uh, some ethyl and a lot of propyl. In green is that mutant she made. And in green, you see that it methylates, but it doesn't ethylate or propylate anymore. So changing one amino acid did it, right? So she's following up, she's found in her genome data set to find a lot of um, bacterial SMTs that have that glycine. And so she's testing those to see if just testing those are propylating, but potentially she's getting to a point where she can start to identify the important amino acids. And so she's continuing to do this, to look for different amino acids and then changing them and trying to see if she can come up with the signature that so when you look in a genome, you see these amino acid changes and you can say, ah, this one propylates, or ah, this one ethylates, this one methylates, so that we can better constrain which organisms are actually propylating. So this is a work in progress, but it looks promising. She was so super excited to get that data. Okay, so finally, to close, the question I always get, so can we use this as a biomarker for sponges? And I have to say, with the data we have now, yeah, they are the organisms that mostly make, that make the most 24 IPC. So given that data, we, we have to accept that, but we have to acknowledge there could be other sources, including bacteria. And as we work out the biochemistry, the really important thing is 
can we find SMTs that generate fees in the ratios that we see in the lock record? Because I'm only showing you presence and absence. I'm not quantifying or anything. So that's really the next step. Can we harness this type of an asset to get to a ratio to say, oh, only the sponges SMT make it in this ratio, right? The bacterial ones, they make it, but they don't do it in the ratios that we would expect in the lock record, right? And so that's kind of like, I think the fine tuning we need to do with these assays. And then ultimately get to an organism. Can we pull out an organism, culture something? So can you understand why are they probably? That is always what people ask me. I'm like, I have no idea why they probably. The physiology is going to be fascinating given the very important role cholesterol has in eukaryotic organisms. Okay. All right. So with that, I hope I convinced you. We can use molecular studies to inform biomarker interpretation. And of course, acknowledging my wonderful lab group that has been just great working through COVID, really kind of trying to pull it together our funding and our collaborators. And I thank you for your attention.